So we're going to talk about this relatively new idea about coherent matter waves and how it connects to some of the phenomena we deal with here at the SSD, what sometimes called anomalous phenomena. And I want to see if we can find an underlying pattern to a kind of underlying set of ideas that actually kind of brings it together to show us that we may be dealing with the same phenomena here rather than separate phenomena. Uh, this is a topic I've been studying for about a year in this context, uh, but actually obviously it goes back a little further than that. My previous presentation to the SSD uh, was about multiverse ideas and uh, different interpretations of uh, quantum mechanics. And this kind of is related as, as we'll see. So what we wanna look at is, are there hidden events with in science such that we only see certain mainstream perspectives and ignore alternative approaches that could shed a lot of light on the data that we see. I mean, this is obviously a major theme of the SSD itself. I believe it's why it was started by the founders many years ago. And it's something that sociologist Ron Westrom has uh, given us some lectures about. Uh, Ron has talked about hidden events within society. Now, hidden events are events that are widely experienced but seldom discussed. And so even though people are experiencing them, we don't really talk about it very much. And I think we can find this happening within science itself with these topics I'm about to show you. And Larry Dossi has called this the shadow side of science, which means that even though science presents itself as a sort of logically driven, empirical, data-oriented enterprise, there's a lot of pressure within science to stick with the picture, to stick with the mainstream. And we're gonna see some really shocking and uh, some unfortunate examples here, but it, it's okay, we'll, we'll see how it kind of turns out over the years. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these uh, hidden events. The, as I mentioned in the Education Day last Saturday, uh, the, the UAP task force, which issued its report from the Pentagon about UFOs, as they refer to them now, UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, identified a barrier to understanding the UAP phenomena, which re really resonated with me as a sociologist. They first and foremost said sociocultural stigmas prevent us from Get, it's learning more about the UAP phenomena. And we're gonna see how this applies to the cold fusion topic in a second. So it's not just a question of data. Often when we have discussions with scientists, they'll say, well, it's really a question of the data, but there's also the willingness to look at data, to look at data that challenges your point of view. And in the case of the UFO UAP phenomena, we won't go into it too much here because we talked about it on Saturday, but there are a lot of barriers to people reporting these sorts of experiences, especially within the military, within the Air Force, within the Navy. And there seems to be an effort within the government right now to turn that around. There's a realization that went too far in the skeptical, or some people will say pseudo-skeptical direction, where no one says anything because they're afraid it's going to affect their career, their uh, reputation, their status within the military, things like that. So people have been mum. You know, pilots seldom talk about sightings they see from their cockpits because uh, unless the policy has changed, even civilian pilots have to undergo psychiatric uh, evaluations for reporting UAPs. You see something, you photograph it, and all of a sudden you have to go through all this hassle. So people don't say anything. Well. For those of us involved in science, this is a huge challenge. How are we going to find out what's going on if we don't have access to data and if the witnesses don't come forward to these phenomena? So how did I get involved with this topic that I'm about to show you? It really started with crop circles. In 2007, I was invited to be the keynote speaker at the SSC event it, uh, in Michigan. Roger Nelson had been on our crop circle tour. Uh, this is something I had been involved in looking at, you know, as an open-minded scientist since the, the late 90s, since I got involved with remote viewing. 
And we found a lot of camera and battery and electronic anomalies around the crop circle phenomena, not getting into a discussion of how they were made, just any old crop circle you'd go around in England and find one that looked like this, 1999 Devil's Den, uh, you would see battery and camera failure. Let me play you, see if I can play you this video. The GPS has just gone wrong, basically, yeah. and the screen has gone. Look at this, this thing sort of pixelated. Mm -hmm. it's the last time I had this, my battery's got really small. Yeah, so this is the sort of thing that I got to experience firsthand. I recorded this video, so we know it really happened. I was there. Three people experienced battery failure within about 10 minutes in this crop circle in, in, uh, near, uh, in Wiltshire, England, near Marlborough uh, in 1999. And I was always curious ever since, how could something that seemed like inert, like wheat actually cause these electromagnetic effects? Well, I came to the SSB meeting in 2007 thinking, well, there are a lot of smart people here. Someone's gonna be able to tell me the answer. but. It really remained a mystery for quite a while, but I think some of what I'm about to show you may explain partly what's going on of why even just the shape of something could create electromagnetic, electrostatic effects strong enough to uh, zap electronics and destroy batteries and so forth. Uh, we also observed this sort of phenomena where the magnetic field in the crop circle was was similar to the pattern, but it should be uniform You're in wheat, and yet you get these really large scale uh, changes in magnetic strength um, going around the formation. This is also kind of a mystery too. So let's go on to uh, cold fusion for a second. You're all familiar with Fleischmann and Pons, the two uh, chemists at the University of Utah in 1989 who uh, claimed at a press conference that they had discovered something that they called fusion. They said they could, the evidence for this was in the experiment they had set up, they were detecting excess heat. And at the time, uh, the ideas around it weren't really strongly formulated and Fleischmann and Pons came under a huge amount of attack. It's not just that they presented their findings to the media, they used a uh, palladium loaded, a uh, palladium metal lattice loaded with deuterium to create their cold fusion effect. And they were promptly pounced on by the media in every possible way. Uh, you can see this article in Time, uh, another article from Science Magazine 1990, uh, where they didn't even give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, they basically, turned on these two researchers and called it junk science, uh, pathological science, cold fusion, only the grin remains. You can't see that on the side of your screen, little icons there of people who are here. And, and these articles were, I've looked at so many of these, these were just really biting criticism, ridicule of something that seemed you know, in some, for some of us seems sort of reasonable. I remember when this came out, I thought that's kind of cool, this is neat. Instead of these huge, keep in mind that at the time fusion was created in these really huge multi-billion dollar reactors that created a magnetic field to confine a fusion reaction, something that like similar that happens on the sun. And it was thought you needed these, ex, you know, expensive, complicated, very, uh, uh, sophisticated machines at the time of fusion reactions had only existed for about a trillionth of a second. It, they never actually did what they were supposed to do. So these guys come along and say, hey, we can do it on a tabletop. And there was a panel at MIT that reviewed it and, you know, uh, completely panned it. Even President Bush at the time, Senior Bush, created a commission. Uh, and, and they determined it wasn't real and therefore you couldn't get patents in it and so forth. However, 
I believe it was in 2015 in San Francisco. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong about the, the year. Uh, Dr. Vittorio Violante came from Italy. Over from he was the keynote speaker. He was the lead scientist for Italy's ENEA, and he told us cold fusion was in fact a real process. It was real. It wasn't easy to produce. It was a finicky process. It sometimes over at the ENEA, it would take them two weeks to get the reaction going. He said the other labs that had tried to reproduce it, like MIT and others that failed, hadn't used the right, the right grain size and palladium, and uh, that you had to dope the palladium. It couldn't be pure palladium. A lot of these labs just got pure palladium from their, wherever they ordered the materials from. You had to dope it with impurities because it was a resonance reaction, and they had gotten it to work, and cold fusion was, in fact, real. So uh, that was a very interesting lecture, too. John O'Meara Bacris, I've uh, talked to some of you who were at the SSC meeting when he showed up in the 1990s. He was considered one of the preeminent electrochemists uh, in the world. And I was fortunate enough to come across his book a couple of years ago, uh, The New Paradigm, to really hear his story. But basically, he attempted to reproduce Fleischmann and Pons, and he got traces of tritium in the water. And at the time, because all the mainstream scientific institutions had come out and said that this was not real. He was accused of fraud. A tribunal was set up within his department to put him on trial. He had to hire an attorney. They accused him of spiking the water with tritium, that he didn't get this naturally, that his grad student must have come in at night and dumped tritium into the water. Tritium is one of the side effects of what it then at the time called cold fusion. We now call it Lenner low energy nuclear reaction. But the tritium, it was later found, you couldn't reproduce it by just dumping tritium in the water. That had a totally different signature. So the charges were dropped. But he later went on to argue something that we'll see in a second, that the cold fusion Lenner process creates nuclear transmutation, something that even Newton tried to uh, do, and we've been told isn't real. But he was able to show that you had chemical elements transmuted into other elements. And for this, another committee was created to try to strip him of his professorship at Texas A&M. Can you imagine that? And he had to go through a whole nother process. Eventually they stopped trying to do this, uh, but they argued because we all know that transmutation is basically alchemy and alchemy is a myth, that this isn't worth our time and we shouldn't look at it. And he went through what was really the most serious type of thing you could go through as an academician, really, and he survived it. So um, we remember him quite fondly for fighting, standing up for cold fusion and being proven right in the end. More recently, we've had the Navy getting interested in cold fusion. Uh, they are looking at it. Uh, this is, you might've seen the spa war research that has come out over the decades. But it turns out the US military has been looking at this the whole time, just the way we were told by Hal Putoff in 2018 that they've been looking at UFOs. They've taken cold fusion very seriously. They didn't consider it junk or pathological science. They realized that, as they call it now, Lenner has the potential to be paradigm shifting, game changing technology, uh, nuclear energy systems, the power densities are six orders of magnitude greater than chemical generation and on and on and all the benefits this could have commercially, and especially for the military, which uses a lot of uh, fuel and energy every day, energy savings and so forth. So the US military has taken, uh, at least some of the labs have taken cold fusion very seriously and found very interesting results. Even more recently than that, we've had patents from Lockheed Martin. Here is their patent for what they call systems and methods for generating coherent matter wave beams. And they specifically reference the Hironhoff Bohm effect, uh, Bohm being, yes, the same David Bohm that created uh, ideas about quantum mechanics, particle waves, and so forth. That's the same Bohm. He, this was created in 1959. And as we're told in the patent, these are systems for generating coherent matter waves, coherent matter wave beams. And the way they're doing this is not by putting energy into a system. It's actually by subtracting energy from a system so particles can become uh, coherent. They describe coherent massless particle beams such as lasers have been successful. 
you know, created many disruptive technologies. And a counterpart to lasers is coherent matter beams, which they claim would be millions of times more powerful than lasers. And the analogy they use here, the Uranov bohm effect, which I'll explain in a second, but it's uh, like when you've seen murmurations of birds flying as a flock or uh, schools of fish, the way they can all sort of coherently move together. It doesn't require more energy to get them to move as the kind of a beautiful wave. It just requires coordination and resonance. And that's really what this entire patent is about. Uh, coherence, resonance and coherence. Exactly what Vittorio Violante told us in San Francisco, for those of you that were there. And if you weren't, you can go back and listen to his lecture. It's well worth uh, listening to. And they talk about the Aronhoff Bohm effect. The Aronhoff Bohm effect being not just that forces act on matter, but energetic potentials from quantum mechanics, potentials which are just mathematical representations, in some cases just by imaginary numbers, have effect on matter. And this was proposed in uh, 1959. And as they show below here, physically demonstrated by Tonomura in 1986. So once as a theory that might have been seen something that you was know, uh, really hard to accept was proven to be real. And they're proposing in this patent, which was awarded by the way this year in March, that we can use the Aronhoff uh, bohm effect to create a cloaking, new types of propulsion, missiles, and a variety of other very interesting technologies. Uh, the least action principle is mentioned here, uh, Aronhoff bohm type of coherence and resonance. So you kind of get the idea. This is sort of a very interesting way of creating order with materials uh, using potential energy, energy potentials, not just force fields. It, it's very different than the way we were trained to think. And this is their mechanism for doing so. It's like a metamaterial which guides these particles through resonant cavities, through this dielectric barrier uh, discharge system, you see the cathode and the anode there, and out come coherent particles that can do all sorts of interesting things. Now, this is also mentioned in a, uh, um, a briefing to the CIA that was declassified in 2003 from Tom Bearden. You might've heard of him. He uh, used to talk about the scalar weapons from the Soviet Union and why we should take these seriously. Apparently he gave a briefing to the CIA, which has been declassified, you can see 2003, where the Aronhoff bohm effect has now been weaponized. This is all the way back in the 80s. And he claimed the Soviets were already using these to influence weather and, and, and all sorts of other effects. You've heard of these attacks on some of the US embassies in communist countries. This is what he was talking about. Uh, you can look at this. This is online. It's been declassified. And it's really interesting of all the types of effects that he shows here. These, and, and he's referencing all sorts of hard to identify phenomena that were seen by pilots and other people in the atmosphere over the years. You may have heard about an incident where there was a very cold zone suddenly detected in the area of the Soviet Union in the 80s, which was suspected to be one of these types of weapons. Uh, here there's a giant radial uh, structure seen in the sky over Florida and Alabama in 1983. Here there was something that has been referred to a Tesla defense weapon, a giant ball of light that was seen from uh, by a plane in Tehran in 1966. Well, the report is full of these cases. It's very interesting to look at. So here's another example of a very similar phenomena. If you can create coherent matter, you can create all sorts of interesting effects. Uh, coherent matter and the Aronhoff bohm effect in the Lockheed patent is specifically mentioned as a way to extract energy from a system, not just to put it in, but to pull energy out of a system to create cooling, okay? And this is what's been seen in several cases. We also have Eric Davis's ball lightning study. Now this is declassified thanks to John Greenwald at the Black Vault. It wasn't publicly available. This is a look at ball lightning 2002. Uh, we're familiar with Eric Davis. This is done for the Air Force. Um, it has requests in there for 
ways of studying this projects that be constructed. He goes through in the documents, very interesting, he goes through the phenomena of ball lightning, uh, what we know about it macroscopically, and then he goes into the smaller scale, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, the interesting thing here is uh, it mentions the same things we see in uh, the Lockheed patents, actually. Uh, you know, electromagnetic vortex, plasmoids, kind of coherent, you know, electrical particles sustained by quantum vacuum energy, Uranov Bohm effect. But then all of a sudden we come across uh, a classification code, uh, Title 10, Section 130, which I looked up and is actually related to the military's legal right to withhold information that has military and space applications. So it talks about some program that the Air Force funded in the 50s and 60s, uh, but it doesn't tell us what it is. Unfortunately, half the document looks like this. So even though this started to off to be a good read on page 30 or so, it just turns into pages where it's completely redacted from, uh, Title 10, Section 130 classification uh, protocols. So we don't know what the rest of the document is about, but we can assume that this might have something to do, since it's the Air Force, with propulsion and anti-gravity. After all, the Lockheed patent specifically mentions propulsion systems, and we know that's what the Air Force is interested in. Uh, I'll show you another section in a second where we see some Air Force funding. So what I'm trying to show you here is something very interesting. Uh, on a public level, we were told that these technologies uh, were just not real, they were pathological science, junk science, so forth, and yet we see all these military patents, applications, and classification codes. So it's really uh, the situation we're in with a lot of these technologies. It's publicly displayed and uh, it's publicly discussed as something that isn't real and should be laughed at, but under the surface we can see the government takes it very seriously. Now. Uh, we appreciate what Eric Davis has done to bring forward a lot of this information recently with UFOs, but I have to say early on in this paper, he refers to many theories of ball lightning as rubbish science. And it's rubbish science here in 2002. I don't like that phrase, but Lockheed Martin gets a patent for it in uh, applies for patent for it in 2011, Iran of Bohm effect, because Davis says it's all theory and there's no evidence. Well, it can take a while to get evidence for some of these theories, as we saw in this case. So what's rubbish science in one decade is patentable in the next, as we can see here. So what is coherent matter? When we're talking about co coherent matter with relationship to ball lightning or cold fusion, because it's really all the same thing, we're talking about rather than uh, electrons having each their own frequency and different temperatures and kind of being discoherent and moving around in their own ways as they do with typical electrical currents, we're talking about creating monochromatic particles. And that means they all have the same frequency and the same temperature. As you saw in the Lockheed Martin little device they created, you can create devices and little metamaterials materials that have special properties to transform matter. If we have them all at the same frequency and the same temperature, they become like that flock of birds, the murmuration or the school of fish. They kind of move as a wave, a coherent wave. So it's not adding more energy. It's actually creating a system where you take energy out of the, out of the collection of particles. So they're all kind of the same. And it becomes something like what's been referred to as a Bose-Einstein condensate. state. The Bose-Einstein condensate was discovered, by the way, just down the road here at NIST, and that's only at low temperatures. The advantage of these systems that we're talking about is it's at room temperature. Not just at the low temperatures you need with Bose-Einstein condensates. Room temperature Bose-Einstein Bose condensates. Now, the Iran, uh, Iran of Bohm effect, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is this really kind of spooky effect. New scientists considered it one of the seven wonders of quantum mechanics in 2010 in their article. But it's basically where you have this reciprocal space of energy potentials, which really affect matter. If you take a particle and you move it around a completely shielded magnetic field, a solenoid as it's called, that particle will be affected by that field, even though there's zero magnetism or electricity in the field, if you measure it, it's zero. It's completely shielded, but the 
and there's different interpretations of this, but just the potentials that you find in the math equations affect the phase of the particle. It's a geometrical effect. It's a function of geometry of the way the particle moves around the solenoid. It, it just is kind of a slow speed. It begins to uh, get some of the phase information from the particles that are completely shielded completely through quantum mechanics with no classical forces whatsoever. And it's spooky, but it's absolutely real. And it's what creates some of the magic we see in, as I'm gonna show you in a second, in ball lightning and in micro ball lightning. It's a resonance effect, basically. That's what we're talking about here. Again, what Vittorio Violante told us in his lecture. Now, we're all familiar with the work of Nikola Tesla. And uh, I'm sure you're aware that this photo is actually a composite, uh, but he liked it. It showed him sitting there with his Tesla coils zapping you know, creating energy and so forth. But the main thing here is Tesla created uh, balls of light. They were about, you know, an inch, inch and a half. They lasted for a few seconds. Uh, and uh, he's associated with this phenomena of actually creating this sort of cold fusion lantern effect before anyone even knew what it was. John Hutchinson, the Canadian inventor, attempted to reproduce Tesla's uh, findings. And he was able to create these so-called Hutchinson metal fractures, where at room temperatures, he was able to do this with metal bars. And in fact, John Alexander, uh, who's been to the SSE many times, gave him a bar that was of molybdenum, molybdenum, excuse me, which was 20 centimeters long and I believe four inches in diameter. You couldn't bend it. Uh, Hutchinson was able to bend it with his recreation of Tesla's technology, a Tesla coil and some other technology. This is all done at room temperature. This is what we're talking about, folks. This is the power of this sort of ball lightning effect. Now, ball lightning, I'll show you some examples. It's this sort of ephemeral balls of light that have been seen around thunderstorms. They've been seen in different, uh, you know, different settings. And it's always been very mysterious and hard to understand. That's why Davis sort of did his study for the Air Force. So what exactly are we talking about here? But the interesting thing about ball lightning is it's not hot, it's room temperature. And it does this to metal samples. Look at this coin embedded in a metal sample from room temperature technology, okay? I'll show you in a second what is doing this. Kenneth Shoulders was someone that uh, was really uh, sent in to figure out how John Hutchinson was doing this. And uh, in the 1980s, he created this idea of uh, exotic vacuum objects, micro ball lightning, tiny little electrical charges that come together in a coherent ball and tunnel through materials. And he wrote a book about it, which is kind of technical, but interesting to read. Uh, he worked with Hal Putoff and Bill Church, and he called his book Evie a Tale of Discovery. You can find it online. There were different names for this phenomenon. At the time, he called it electron validium, strong electrons. He later changed it to exotic vacuum objects, charge clusters. It has a different name, but it's really all the same thing. And Kenneth Shoulders was the one who said, it's so easy not to find stuff. You won't even know you didn't find it, <laughs> right? Uh, because at the time, people were really not completely open to this phenomenon. Winston Bostick was another person in the 50s that experimented with micro ball lightning. He called them plasmoids. And he said they seem a lot like linear universes. The New York Times had a story about him in the 50s, which you can find where it says, you know, mini universes created in a test tube. You can see what they look like on the left. Uh, Bostic worked for, I think it was either the Department of Energy, one of the US government agencies to try to find peaceful uses of nuclear fusion. And he created what he thought would uh, create a propulsion that would take us to Mars in 15 or 16 hours, 15 to 20 hours, I believe. And this is what he thought it would do. Physicists create the universe in a test tube. These are these little plasmoids, these exotic vacuum objects uh, that Kenneth Shoulders um, uh, referred to and studied. We, we think it's really all the same effect. It's just, you know, different different scales and different sizes. Now, the interesting thing about Bostic is he published some articles. And when we looked at the, if you look at them, you'll see they're all, they're funded by the US Air Force. This is what 
the Air Force was funding in the 50s and 60s was plasma induced propulsion systems. This seems to be what was redacted in Eric Davis uh, article on ball lightning. Uh, Bostic worked at Stevens Institute of Technology in as it was called at the time in uh, New Jersey. Now, Feynman was once asked about this, Richard Feynman, and you know he had the story about him with the Joseph Papp engine we can talk about in questions and answers. He was very skeptical initially, but he changed his mind. Uh, there were some casualties when he pulled that plug out of a wall at a demonstration in UCLA. He thought it was fraud and he started messing with the machinery and it blew up uh, and someone was killed. Uh, several people were wounded, but later on he said it's interesting that something like this can be around for 30 years, but because of certain prejudices of what is and what is not significant, continues to be ignored. Okay, so even Richard Feynman accepted that this is a real phenomenon. And by the way, I'm getting a lot of the ideas here from, uh, I'll show you in a second, from Bob Greener. Uh, he has a good YouTube channel. He's very open about all of this Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Uh, here's another patent you may have heard about recently. You've heard about the Navy patents. You've heard about the Tic Tacs and so forth, the Navy encounters in the East and West Coasts. Uh, this is the Salvatore Pais patents. When you look at it, it's the same thing we've been looking at. He's using... This is just one of the patents that uses lead zirconium tintinate to create a piezoelectric effect and coherent particles. It's doing the same thing that quartz would do, quartz crystals. It's really all the same thing. You're creating coherent matter. There's just many different ways to do it. Uh, it I don't know if this is really, if you challenge these patents, if this is really legitimate, given that Kenneth Shoulders already discovered all this. It's in his book, E.V. A Tale of Discovery. Just take a look from, uh, from the 80s, but there you go. Uh, so we're not talking about lasers here. We're talking about basers. What would a baser be? Well, like a laser is this, you know, based on light, a baser is based on bosons. We're taking materials and making them bosonic, which means they pair together. Large ball lightning looks like this. If you look on Wikipedia and do some basic research, it's this strange phenomenon that comes down chimneys into people's rooms. It comes through windows. Now, again, the interesting thing about ball lightning is it can go through a metal surface, this coherent matter as we're describing it here, and it can make the metal seem like putty. As George Eagley described, it occurred to someone riding a train in Russia, and they could touch the metal and move it with their fingers. It was room temperature. Molten metal that's room temperature. It's hard to wrap your mind around given our training. Here's all the people that have been involved, some of the people, I should say, that have been involved with ball lightning studies. And we haven't heard, I hadn't heard of most of these people. It's, it's what we're talking about in terms of hidden events within science itself. There's a long lineage of people before Tesla that were looking at ball lightning and we've forgotten most of them. Some of them were Americans. They did hundreds of studies and gathered data and so forth. So it's a kind of a hidden event, but as we've seen, it's uh, people are interested in patenting it now. Um, it's been called micro ball lightning, what we're about to look at. Small scale ball lightning. Uh, Takayaki Matsumoto in Japan, who's been studying this since the 90s, 80s, itonic clusters. Kenneth Shoulders called it exotic vacuum objects, all the same thing. Characteristic of exotic vacuum objects are it's persistent, they tunnel, they cause these things called strange tracks, transmutation electro nuclear collapse, and they generate these quantum crystals. They sort of look like this as they're tunneling through a surface. They have a little type of mushroom shape. The head part is sort of is rotating quite rapidly through a magnetic force. And they kind of tunnel through materials. I'll just show you quickly what they look like from an electron scanning microscope. They create these very interesting impact craters, which are seen in the Hutchinson samples. This is why it's reasonable to assume this is what's going on with the John Hutchinson effect. EVOs are causing it. If you expose things like copper coins to these EVOs, and there's different ways to do that, you end up with a variety of uh, chemical elements that were not originally in the sample. You get these beautiful fractal-like crystals from exposure to EVOs. 
and they're seen like little micro tornadoes where I have the arrow on the blue arrow there on the left. That's an actual photo that Takayaki Matsumoto in Japan took of how they kind of corkscrew through a material. They're not physically moving, but the structure of the Evo, it's, and I'll show you what it looks like in a second. It's kind of like a self replicating fractal set of rings and it creates from magnetic force, it creates a lot of motion at a microscopic scale and tunnels its way through materials. You can also see on the right, at the top right, what it looks like uh, when it tunnels through a material. It leaves these impact craters, which are fascinating. We don't have time to go into all this now. And these little magnetic particle structures. Uh, EVOs are believed to be magnetic monopoles, uh, not the persistent type that would kind of challenge the basis of physics, but emergent magnetic monopoles, they're, they're, they lean in that direction. And they create these little tornado-like shapes. This is ball lightning at a microscopic scale. And it emits little particles spiraling around. If you put it, you know, if you do a fast frame uh, photography of it as it's uh, illuminated, which some believe are these kind of cold neutrinos that interact with matter very similar to the relic neutrinos from the Big Bang. This is an image the way Bob Greenier describes his view of what the EVO looks like. It's very similar to what other people have described, kind of a nested set of rings. It creates motion, but none of them are actually moving. It's just that each one is creating this magnetic force, which gives the whole thing a lot of momentum, kind of like a mini tornado. And this is John Wheeler's description of the same phenomena going back to 1955. Now, if you if you were at my previous lectures, uh, I was talking about um, the multiverse theory and Hugh Everett, who was John Wheeler's student at Princeton. John Wheeler called these EVOs geons. It's the same thing. Strong electrical field strength with these little circular patterns in a ring that creates a gravitational field. You can see why the Air Force might be interested in this. It creates its own gravity. That's how it tunnels through a material. It's kind of, it pushes through and it creates force on the other side. Wheeler somehow discovered this in the 50s. And as you can see, the, the part of the point of this lecture, this has been rediscovered and rediscovered in different countries for decades. It's all the same thing. Here is an Evo that was photographed in a Russian experiment that persisted for two days after the electricity was turned off. They tunnel into a material. Uh, Ken Shoulders said they believe, he believed they could last indefinitely. They can tunnel in and they can keep transmuting and doing things indefinitely. In this case, it turned off after two days. This is what the tracks look like of these EVOs. On the, uh, on the top is an experiment that someone who calls themselves Lion in the UK did 2017 you can see they kind of tunnel around at this kind of random walk and then stop and, and, and stay right there. Kenneth Shoulders photographed it. You can see on the bottom left, this kind of fractal plant-like shape of the Evo tunneling to the material. Now on the right is a Russian tokamak reactor, regular old nuclear fusion done with the big reactors and the magnetic confinement fields. And it produces the same looking effect. Maybe these are the exact same EVOs produced in a different way because the shoulders technique is done with a tabletop device just with a cathode and an anode uh, emitting little particles and letting them cluster together. Now here's one of the most fascinating things about this whole process. Uh, it creates a whole realm of chemical elements. You can start with any substance you want. It could be uh, it could be any heavy metal, uh, whatever the EVOs go into, they're going to churn out carbon. And then after they get through carbon through the different chemical cycles, the way carbon is produced, you're going to get all the elements that are necessary for life. And this is just from Mark Leclerc's cavitation experiments. You can produce EVOs from cavitation, shaking water with an ultrasonic machine. You can buy them on Amazon and do this yourself if you take the time. You start with water and you end up with all of these chemical elements. Yes, the ones at the right are the heavy, unstable elements, but that's only if you keep pushing, keep the machine going too long, keep, keep the vibration too hard. You end up with lead and calcium, 
fascinating stuff. This is literally alchemy. This is what John Bacharis got in severe trouble with at the Texas A&M. But look at the data, it's real. Alchemy turns out to be true. I know you probably heard like me, if you went to school that alchemy doesn't work. It turns out it, it's real. Case in point, this is a pure lead ball photographed by Takeaki Matsumoto. You can see a carbon plume coming out of pure lead after the EVOs penetrated into the lead ball. How do you get carbon from a pure lead ball unless some sort of alchemy is going on at a nuclear level, nuclear transmutation? I mean, this is what Ken Shoulders talked about and it's the evidence. It takes a while to get the evidence. Uh, this has been seen by all the researchers that do this. We, you don't know if you're looking at this, is, is that a coming from the surface? Where, where is it coming? But that has been measured and it's, uh, it's been determined to be pure carbon, a plume of carbon dust. Here is carbon film being ejected from indium after being exposed to EVOs. It's just ejected right out of the indium. Look at that film. How, how is that possible? So this is a type of a transmutation process, which is fascinating. And I'm sure this, this is why conventional scientists may be really challenged by this. But again, this is the data. Other people have been exposed, uh, seen the same thing. Uh, we've all been told that electrons attract uh, excuse me, electrons repel each other because they're fermions, but at close ranges, they attract. I was talking to someone in my local cafe, John Hauser, and he's, he's an engineer CU. He said, I mean, how could electrons attract? They repel each other. That's what we read in the textbooks, but these results all show that at very close ranges, go back to the Lockheed Matt, a Martin patent, you can create coherence from these charged particles if you do it in the right way. So at very close, uh, very close ranges, they attract. There's just more going on. Ken Shoulders mentioned that the Egyptians could probably do this too. All you need is cat hair to create electrostatic charges, beeswax to create an insulator in some way to generate a spark, and you'd create these EVOs. In fact, EVOs seem to be generated every time you get a little static charge. They're generated by your car's automobile engine, lightning, but they're not becoming coherent balls because they're not in the right environment to do that. They just disperse. So EVO seem to be, and this is really one of the main points here, a natural part of the universe. They've, they've always existed and we're just sort of discovering it now. So at low temperatures, you get Bose-Einstein condensates, but micro ball lightning EVOs are room temperature. So basically nature uses the same processes, but it's using it in different ways. And these EVOs seem to be something that are actually fundamental to life, especially as you can see before from the chemical element chart that you're creating all these chemical elements. This probably could be used to terraform planets and some have proposed using it to clean up the waste at Fukushima because if you put it into radioactive substances, it could transmute those to harmless carbon. So um, there's some real uh, applications. now. What I want to look at here is how does this apply quickly before we go to questions. So some of the phenomena we've been interested here that I've been interested in, I'm sure some of you are interested in, like the Hestalen light. I found out recently that similar phenomena are at a place called Brown's Mountain in North Carolina. Maybe you know about that, John. The Brown Mountain lights, the Marfa lights in Texas. These are anomalous lights that show up. Some people have thought they were UFOs. From this point of view, these would be naturally occurring EVOs, balls of light, because of the chemical elements in the soil, uh, the silicon and uh, other elements that would, from lightning and other sources, would generate these EVOs spontaneously. At, at the top right here, you can see one that hit a tree limb and it starts spiraling. So it can interact with matter. It's it's real enough here that interacts with matter. So perhaps this is an explanation for the Hestalen lights. In crop circles, this seems to me to be a very logical way to think about what's going on with all the battery and camera failure. I'm happy to do another lecture. I did in 2007 about a lot of what we've seen. When EVOs come around any sort of you know grounded uh, electronics, batteries and so forth, they're attracted to metals and things like this. They don't play nice with semiconductors. This is something we would have to work out if we use them as a type of technology. When an EVO goes into a wire, it collapses. 
and it releases something like five kilovolts of electricity all at once. This would explain why when we go into crop circles, you get this sudden failure. Somehow the coherent shape of the crop circle could be leading to the creation of EVOs. After all, some of the stocks are up, some of the stocks are down. That's like a charge separation right there. And to me, this could be a very good explanation. I mean, this is something that's not only been seen around crop circles, it's been seen around all these Leonard cold fusion experiments. Tesla blew out some transformers. John Hutchinson blew out some transformers. Others have blown out transformers around these EVOs. I mentioned the Joseph Papp uh, demonstration at UCLA when Feynman was there. When Fein There was a ground plugged into the wall and Feynman said, ah, you're cheating. It's got to be electrical source. He pulled it out. Well, that's that was grounding the EVOs they built up in the machine and it caused an explosion, if we're to understand it correctly. So this could be why we get short circuits around uh, crop circles, in my view. This would be one of the leading explanations. By the way, that is a ball of light at the lower right. Uh, a German tourist actually saw that and took a photo. We were on the hill right behind. We were waiting for him to join us for a type of group meditation in the crop circles with Koch and Kyborg. And he, the German tourist photographed that little ball of light uh, moving around there over the, over the East Field. So that's how, uh, to me, coherent shapes of crop circles could lead to these kind of coherent types of matter that uh, on discharge create a lot of, uh, a lot, can create a lot of electronic destruction. So, man, we need to yeah. start wrapping it up. Because yeah. we're so I've got a couple more slides here. Let me see. This is just about the last two. Thanks. Okay, good, good. So, uh, so for uh, UFOs, first of all, you may have heard of this event where Brad Sorensen saw this thing called the Flux Liner. He went to an air show at Norton Air Force Base and some of the people were invited to another place. He apparently saw something that uh, Fortunately, no longer with us, Mark McCandlish, the graphic illustrator, drew. Brad said the room felt really cold. We know that John Hutchinson, when he's done work with this Tesla technology, said the room gets cold. As we saw earlier, uh, the Lockheed patent says that it kind of can pull energy out. This is why perhaps some UFO sightings create this feeling of cold around them because they're using this technology as pulling energy right out of the atmosphere. You also get balls of light around UFOs, camera and batter, battery failure, and the smell of sulfur, which it seems to me could be evidence of the same type of nuclear transmutation you get around EVOs. It would make sense. Uh, if you wanna read about this, this excellent book is available from, published by NICAP in the 60s, Strange Effects from UFOs, uh, full of cases of balls of light, smells of sulfur, and really weird electromagnetic effects from the, the 60s when this book was written. Um, from sightings of these objects, which we know is all of a sudden being taken very seriously, we call UAPs now. So this could be why we get such strange electromagnetic effects around some UFOs, because it's the same technology at work. And finally, Bigfoot, the last thing I want to talk about here. This is something I started studying just about a year ago, visiting the Sasquatch outpost in Bailey, Colorado. I had met some witnesses who had seen Bigfoot at my remote viewing classes in Colorado, but I sort of dismissed it as something that was very rare until I went to the Sasquatch outpost, found that these were much more common than I thought. And we get these same reports around Bigfoot. Glowing eyes, eyes that emit light, balls of light around Bigfoot, teleportation, Bigfoot kind of moving in these nonlinear ways here or there. It, it, it doesn't seem consistent with an ape, uh, just an undiscovered wood ape. Camera and battery failure and the smell of sulfur, the same sort of thing that would indicate transmutation. This picture was taken a couple months ago by a woman in Drake, Colorado, who I got to speak to at a conference in Bailey a couple of weeks ago. And she heard these weird sounds. They were looking after someone's cabin. She heard the sounds of children playing and she thought what she saw was movement. She aimed her camera and filmed something that looks sort of like, you can see the eyes and the nose, but the real important thing here is then her camera completely died, the, the iPhone. And she felt disoriented for a day and a half, she told me. She felt confused. She could barely find her way back to the car where her husband was waiting. He had to knock stones together. This is also reported. If you do your research about Bigfoot sightings, 
strange electromagnetic effects. Very hard to explain if it's just a flesh and blood creature. Uh, Ken Collins gave us a talk. He saw balls of light around a Bigfoot near Bailey, Colorado with two other witnesses. And Igor Burtsov, who is really the reigning Bigfoot researcher from the Soviet Union previously, he's been studying uh, Bigfoot for 50 years, told us, and I had private conversation with him at the Bailey conference, that uh, he first thought it was an undiscovered ape, then maybe a type of Neanderthal that hadn't been discovered, but now he thinks it's a type of telepathic paranormal human that we maybe perhaps are from, but we have forgotten how to do these things that the Bigfoot know. It's basically a type of human that can do cloaking and teleportation. So I'm suggesting here, perhaps there's types of life on earth that already that know how to use these evos in a way that we've forgotten that they're generating some sort of similar process maybe that's what all the fur is for is generate static charges people have seen bigfoot that seem to discharge electricity uh, no joke you can look on youtube is full of excellent videos about this they're great books on amazon purely with witness encounters uh, by the way and this is just about the last slide this was the map I saw in Bailey. I had thought that this was a rare phenomenon looking at the map just in my area around Boulder. I couldn't believe there were so many sightings, uh, uh, evidence for very large footprints, the tree knocking sounds, um, and other uh, sorts of things, tree structures and things that are seem to be evidence of the Bigfoot creature that it's really, I bet if you look in your area, you'll see that it's more prevalent than you thought to. But the real interesting thing to me is the electromagnetic effects and why it may be the same thing we've been talking about for the past hour. So in any case, before we had the ATEP program, if you think this is really strange, we did have OSAP and they were out there at Skinwalker Ranch uh, looking at these phenomena. So it does seem that people are aware, our own government is aware of these phenomena. The on slide nine, the slide that was leaked from Chris Mellon's site that he said it's okay to show, we've asked him. DOD controlled several facilities where activities have been detected. We know that was Skinwalker Ranch where there were Bigfoot-like sightings. The, the, the Department of Defense was studying these cryptids and things like this. In any case, thanks for listening. That's my lecture. Do we have any questions? I think there'll be plenty of questions uh, with this type of topics. Um, thank you so much, Simeon. Sure. There's just um, such a richness to um, and I hope there's a, these are some of the books that uh, Simon has written, and I hope that you're yeah. planning to write a, a book about all this stuff as well. Yes, it's in the works. Okay, yeah. great. I'm happy to hear that because it's very much needed out there to educate people as to all these nuances. And, you know, you have to do a lot of digging to be able to get into these, these topics. So first at the podium, which is very common at most of our SSC conferences, is Jörg Dobbins asking, Tesla is widely regarded as a crank because he didn't accept the standard theories of electromagnetism. Did Tesla publish any details of the variant theory he worked with? Has anyone tested it? Yes, and thanks, Jörg. That's a great question. That's exactly what John Hutchinson set out to do. His dad was an engineer and I've been following some of John Hutchinson's comments on YouTube in response to the videos at the Martin Fleischman Memorial Project. And he has been very specific about what pages to look at from Tesla's writings to literally recreate the Tesla technology. So yes, it may, may have not fit the theories of the time, but I think the evidence shows that it's a real effect and John Hutchinson was able to do it. Because John Hutchinson, he said he didn't do this, he just followed Tesla's books. So great question. Okay, William Beatty, uh, why is magnetism called the B field? Because Michael Faraday insisted that vector potential was far more important and central to simple basic electromagnetics. The A field where magnet magnetism was far less significant to EM theory. Search on Faraday and electronic states. Um, and if anyone wants a PDF copy of Ken Shoulder's book, I guess William is is offering. Um, and then William also adds, well, a light bulb in a microwave oven develops vacuum leaks produced by microscopic drill holes in the glass adjacent to the sharp tips of the filament supports. Yes, that, that is. Mm -hmm. true. So Carol, think of the potential and yet also the damage this could cause to current economic engines. I can see many companies not wanting this out there. 
it's all about the money. Uh, yeah, and I would point out there is an inventor out there, a very controversial inventor, Andrea Rossi. You might have heard about the ECAT. Uh, this is how I discovered all of this. I was looking at the website ECAT World, which is run by a person that just focuses on these topics. And I got to learn more and more about it. Whether the ECAT itself really works or not isn't actually relevant to me anymore because, I mean, the phenomenon itself is real. Whether Rossi's actually produced it, he could have. But it seems to me the science is there that it works. That's all I'd say about it. Okay, well, I think that's about it other than comments. Simon, if you want to download the chat to look at the comments that people Great. made, you're welcome to. I'm happy to, thank yeah. you. Uh, Stephen Hall is asking, a, Stephen Hall is asking a question. Can any of this tech explain the Havana effect? That's what some people think. Now, I've read different interpretations, but I, I'm, I'm suspicious of Science Magazine's <laughs> interpretations. They, they think they, they and just, to go to the conventional explanations, they attribute it more to these sort of coherent hysterical reactions that people have. They start having similar reactions to other people and they don't think there's anything there. On the other side, there are people who claim it's this sort of Tom Bearden type of effect that he talked about scalar wave technology, you know, creating effects at a distance through this controlled, uh, multiple scalar waves that creates this kind of coherent matter. So it, it could be what we're talking about here. Uh, I don't know if we have enough data to really know, but it, some people think so. Okay, we, uh, Mark Krusen would like to ask a question. So if you wanna come off camera, that will be fine. But what I'll do first is um, I will conclude the recording of the meeting now. And again, I wanna thank you, Simeon, so much. Oh, thank you, Chantal. For an outstanding presentation, which you know, never fails to be quite, uh, quite stimulating and eye-opening. And, and you're doing- May science it. always be like that. Yes, yes, may science always be with us. It should be fascinating and challenging. It should challenge us. Yes, thank you.